Okay, uh, let me know if I'm too quiet or anything. Um, but so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you. Um, I know that you all have a lot going on yourselves and I really appreciate it. And it's really an honor to have the opportunity to share um, some of the lessons that we have from our New York campaign. Um, so I want to start by giving a little bit of background about rent control and rent stabilization in New York State. Um, New York City is, uh, so, so New York probably has the strongest tenants rights in the United States, but of course the United States doesn't really believe in tenants rights and believes in property rights over everything else. Um, so our tenants rights are sort of an anomaly. Um, in the city of New York, uh, tenants in buildings who live, tenants who live in apartment buildings with more than six apartments have the right to a renewal lease. Um, and then they have, they have rent stabilization and rent control. And that's sort of our basic legislative framework that we've had for about a century. Um, for about a century, our rights as tenants in New York City have been under attack by the real estate industry since almost as soon as these laws came into effect. Um, and just as much as New York City is the epicenter of tenant power in the United States, it's also the epicenter, it's also the home to Wall Street. Um, it is a place where I think the, the, the thing that most people know about New York City is that it's a completely unaffordable place to live. Um, and just as much as we have a sort of framework of renter protections, we have um, an extremely powerful real estate industry that in many ways controls our political system. And that's really important to know as we um, put our rent control fight and our rent control victories in some context. Um, the other piece of context is that um, it's not just a New York fight. There are a whole host of national interests, national conservative interests that um, see rent stabilization as a sort of affront to capitalism and private property and like their sort of like founding ideals. Um, so in 1997, our rent regulation laws were weakened significantly and that was a large part because of out-of-state um, corporate spending on behalf of corporate interests who wanted to uh, weaken rent control. So I say that to say that like um, our enemies are many um, and unfortunately as you know in the United States um, just like sort of one more piece of important context is that right now we have a situation where a rent stabilized landlord who made their fortune defrauding tenants and evicting people is our president. And so I just say all of that to say that um, the power of corporate real estate sort of underlies everything that we did in our fight to strengthen rent stabilization in New York. Um, it's an, landlords are an incredibly potent political force in our city and in our state and in our country. And um, property ownership is uh, the sort of the ideology that we are fighting against. Um, so, all that being said, um, we had an enormous victory uh, last last month when we were able to strengthen and expand rent control in New York City for the first time in a generation, um, and expand it to cover the whole state. So, I want to share a little bit of what um, what some of our lessons are. Um, from that fight. Um, we uh, eliminated vacancy decontrol, which means that there's going to be no more deregulation of apartments, of rent stabilized apartments in New York. We eliminated other loopholes that allow landlords to raise rents for um, capital improvements or building wide improvements. And we expanded the system that once covered just New York City and the surrounding three counties to cover all, um, all 62 counties in New York State. Um, and so we also, um, it's like a little more boring and I don't want to go into the details, but I can send a write up for, for anyone who's interested in the policy details. We made it a lot harder for landlords to evict people. We strength, we strength the notice requirements. We eliminated a tenant blacklist. So courts can no longer sell your information to, um, prospective landlords. And we made it, um, we made it a lot harder for, 
um, landlords to sort of fraudulently raise their rents. It's, we made it easier for tenants to sort of challenge their legal rent um, in court without uh, a fear of retaliation. Um, we're still in like the beginning phases of what that will look like, but the real estate industry is completely freaking out. Um, they are like, New York is over. Uh, we're gonna just let our building fall into disrepair. It's gonna be total chaos. Private property is dead. The socialists are running our state. You know, they're really freaking out in a way that is um, probably completely overhyped, but it, it does go to show that what we really did was take aim at like the, the heart of political power in our state and we're successful. Um, so some of our lessons, um, since about 19, I guess in the 1970s is when the landlord started, started winning real weakening amendments into rent stabilization and rent control. We've lost about 300 to 400,000 units of um, rent stabilized housing. This year we decided that we did and, 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 and since that time, we've been sort of like fighting to defend what we have. And we've said, you know, there's, you know, we in, two, in, in 1997, we said, wow, there's only 2 million rent stabilized departments. Then we said, oh my God, there's only 1 million rent stabilized. We like, we were defending what we had um, from further loss. This year, we decided that we wanted to go on the offensive, and we said, you know what, just defending what we have is not good enough. Um, we want to strengthen rent stabilization and fix all the ways it has been broken and close the landlord-friendly loopholes that drive evictions and rent increases, but we also want to expand it to cover the whole state. So we want every renter in the state of New York to live free from the fear of an arbitrary eviction and free from the fear of a crazy rent hike. And that's what we believe in and that's what we're fighting for. And that's what you, the state of New York needs to give us. Um, that meant that we were organizing tenants in the city of New York together with tenants in rural parts of upstate New York. Um, so New York is an incredibly diverse state. Um, it's like, New York City, which you can imagine what New York City is like, but there's also a lot of smaller cities in Western New York, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse. There's rural parts of our state. There's like towns along the Hudson River Valley that are now tourist hotspots and that are there for gentrifying and facing a lot of sort of housing market pressures from tourism or from, um, uh, there's a lot of like university towns in our state. And so, um, we said that no matter where you live and no matter where you rent, you shouldn't face an eviction and that we wanted a one fair rent system for the entire state of New York and that we needed our state legislators to protect a renter in Buffalo the same as they were protecting a renter in Brooklyn. Um, the other way that we went on the offensive and we sort of expanded our movement in a really critical way is that we said that we were done with uh, state policymakers treating homeless New Yorkers and renters as separate parts of policymaking. Um, homelessness and housing are sort of intrinsically related. If you're not a policymaker, that makes sense to you. But um, if you are a policymaker, you're like, okay, well, like homeless, we're dealing with that over there. And that's really about like, like helping individuals find a new place to live. It's often treated as like a behavioral issue or, um, or a, like a, it's like wrapped up in like, like problems of like substance abuse. But we were like, actually, you know what, this is an economic problem of like rents going up. And we want to fight with homeless New Yorkers to end evictions. We think that if we can end evictions, we can end homelessness. Um, and so we were organizing together with unhoused people and also renters together to fight for protections against evictions and to fight against rent hikes. So that's sort of like the first lesson is that um, we went on the offensive and we built a new kind of statewide movement of 70 plus organizations that were going to um, demand really the impossible um, and just expand the horizons of what it meant to have housing as a human right in New York State. Um, the second lesson that I want to share is really around what it means to sort of like seize a political moment. Um, so like I said, in 2016, 
unfortunately, our country elected a landlord to the White House. Um, and there's been like an immense amount of political backlash on that um, in a way that has built the left. Um, and we were able to join sort of like these established tenant groups who have been fighting for stronger tenants rights for many years, um, whether or not sort of irregardless of what what sort of what's happening with the, with electoral politics, um, we were able to sort of join together um, the longstanding anti-displacement tenant movement, which is much more like we are fighting against evictions, we're fighting against landlords with a with a like newly energized progressive electoral movement that like just hated Donald Trump and just hates the fact that he's in the White House and he's racist and he's Europe like repensable and a disgusting human and, and he's a landlord. And so we were able to like take a lot of that energy and like pull that into this fight for stronger tenants rights, which, um, which really was just a unique opportunity to seize a political moment to um, add a lot of like fire and energy and excitement and a newly energized left in New York City and in New York State to say we want rent control and we don't want landlords like Donald Trump dictating our political process. So some of the things that we did is we um, said to policymakers and our governor and our state legislature, you can't accept donations from the real estate industry anymore. Um, Trump, before he was president, donated prolifically to Democrats and Republicans of both sides of the aisle to win real estate friendly politics and new policies in New York. Um, there is a way, there's a sort of expression among tenant organizers in the housing movement that um, real estate money in New York is like oil in Texas. Our corporate landlords who sort of dominate Wall Street and like build penthouses along Fifth Avenue control our political system through donations and through ideology and through personal relationships and friendships. And Donald Trump is perhaps the best example of that. Um, and we were able to sort of like say, coming off of the 2016 election, like we are done with that. Um, we're not doing that anymore and like take a whole bunch of energy from the sort of like quote unquote resistance, which like, you know, whatever, pros and cons there, but like add that to sort of like growing tenant, uh, like sort of long established tenant movement um, to create a broad based movement for change. Um, and so then I guess like my, so that's like the second lesson is like we took, we seized a political moment um, to put a lot of energy behind um, a movement for renters rights that had been sort of on the defensive for a long time. Um, and then my third lesson is sort of related to my second lesson and my first lesson, which is like, we didn't just target our governor and we didn't just target state policymakers. This campaign was a referendum on the role that real estate plays in New York politics. Um, we took aim at our landlords. We empowered tenant associations who were fighting like Achilles management with just a big landlord in New York. Um, and said, you know what, state legislature, like you can stand with them or you can stand with us. And so it was a real way in which every, like sort of by targeting the corporate power that real estate holds in New York, um, we were able to organize tenant associations from like the very like building or block level to a statewide legislative movement and to sort of make a very clear moral argument. Whose side are you on? Are you on the, the side of the evictors or are you on the side of the renters who make up half of the state? Um, and we found a captive audience for that, I think probably because of the other two lessons. Um, and so, yeah, those are my, those are like the sort of like three things. It's like target the landlords. We, we seized a political moment and we built a diverse movement from rural and urban parts of the state. So hey, great. Thanks so much. Steve. <laughs> thank you very much. But we wanted to make a little, first of all, thank you for accepting. I know you guys organizing and uh, we want to learn as much as possible. Vancouver, as you know, you know, we're more or less on the same boat. You guys are ahead. We're just looking uh, to learn of your experience. And we want to thank you for being with us here in COPE. But I want to take the opportunity to see if anyone has a question for you. 
before uh, you go. Is there any question for Sia? Yes. Are there any um, mistakes that you made that you think you should try to avoid? Okay. Did you mistakes. hear that question? Is there any mistakes that were done during the campaign that you should uh, let us know ahead of time? That we yeah. want to do it? Totally. Um, yes, we made tons of mistakes. And um, to me, most of those mistakes are around um, around sort of like, how do we make sure that we, so our coalition had like 70, organi 70 different organizations in it. Um, we needed to make sure that people's voices from upstate New York, which typically has sort of less tenant organizing infrastructure, and downstate New York were equally heard. Um, and so one mistake would be is just making the space for, um, for sort of like diverse organizations and um, organizations with less experience to participate in the campaign and making sure that um, everyone's voices is like pushed forward sort of equally. Um, oftentimes we found that the orgs with more experience would push forward almost a less, um, a less imaginative vision for what the world we wanted to win. Um, and so I would say like a mistake or just like a lesson is like, don't let your sort of experience or your um, or your losses limit the scope of what you can imagine to be possible and demand the impossible because you never know what you're going to get and and don't 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 let like the experts and the technocrats tell you you can't win this thank you so much yeah. you know i'm pretty sure there's a, a number of questions just one one question we're a little what was the strategy you used to decide either what was the strategy you used to decide what types of organization would best support the tenants rights mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's commendable to have 70 organizations come alongside and probably that is the real trick to it all. Yeah, so I would say that we had both a sort of, so the upstate and downstate thing was our strategy. So the first is that we did sort of intentional recruiting from parts of different parts of New York State that didn't typically like think about tenants, right? Um, and we intentionally recruited organizations from there. The second is that we had a messaging strategy. So at a certain point, um, landlords started saying they're trying to kill jobs, they're trying to kill jobs. So we recruited organizations, with labor unions and workers centers, who could say, actually, our members are renters. We're workers and workers and renters together. So we, that's when we started recruiting unions and things like that. Um, and the third sort of piece of the strategy is that we wanted this to be a campaign that knit together um, neighborhood-based tenant groups into a statewide vision for change. Um, so we were recruiting sort of neighborhood-based tenant unions who had like sort of that on the ground experience with the things that we were fighting for so that they could be the people leading our fight. Yeah, thank you very much for your response, for your work, for your effort. You're inspiring. We're happy that things can be done. We hope to follow the steps of you and many other cities. We know we can do it. Well, we want to see, you know, we have a mind of a city we want. And in any case, we want to thank you for sharing your experience with us and send our greetings from Vancouver, Canada. And, um, and, and thank you very much for participating with us. I hope this is not the last time. Me too. Bye. Bye. Bye.